throughout the entire webinar so we can answer all questions um, for everybody. Um, do we have everyone here today? Is, is Doug, Doug's Thanks, there, Sarah. waiting on Doug to get on. We're just waiting on Doug to hop on. Yep. I'm on, go ahead. I'm taking us, uh, I'm just waiting <laughs> for YouTube Live to kick in here. Beautiful. Which it's attempting to do. <laughs> <laughs> and we're live yay all right Beautiful. welcome everyone to tm 101 we are now in 2.0 uh, sessions this fall today we will be discussing logistics 2.0 um, <laughs> if, if you have yet to change your chat settings please do so right now um i will pass the ball over to Mary Jo to introduce our special guest and we will get logistics 2.0 started today. All right. Yay. I'm a total logistics nerd. So I'm really we're excited just, for this continue, one. <laughs> we continue to have, to have these webinars where we're all nerding out. Yes. This yeah, is a super nerdy nerding, one. This is, we're nerding out. <laughs> no. It never ends. I know. Nerdiness. So logistics is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as the detailed coordination of a complex operation involving many people, facilities, or supplies, which basically sums up what we do. Um, and our guests today are experts at this on very large levels. Our guests today are Doug Weisner of Quantum Jets, Bob Dates from Dates Personal Logistics, and Zan Starbuck from Rocket Cargo. Yay, um, amazing panel today. Um, so I'm just gonna hop into intros. Um, gonna let everybody introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about themselves. And we will start with, uh, with Doug. Um, you're the Director of Entertainment and Touring at Quantum Jets. Um, what's your background and what brought you to logistics? You and what makes you love jets? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, my logistics past has been really interesting. I started we back in 2007, which may not seem too long for, for some of these veterans on the panel here. But uh, back in 2007, I was with a small company down in San Diego. Uh, we did everything from tour buses uh, to hotels to commercial air, working with anything that toured on the road. So it was anything from Cirque du Soleil to the Harlem Globetrotters to the WNBA. Jumping from that years later, got into freight forwarding. Um, and then finally found my niche in private aviation back in 2012. So many same clients followed me along the path, but it was really interesting seeing kind of all aspects, whether it was booking in the Globetrotters to beds uh, and hotels back in, in 07 to doing freight forwarding for big acts in Europe, uh, and then now finally getting into jets. Cool. Um, that brings us to Bob. Bob, before you started Dave's Personal Logistics, uh, to manage ground transportation for the entertainment industry. You have worn many hats in this industry. Am I allowed to say how long you've been in this industry? Yes, as long as you don't give out my age. Let everybody else do the math. Bob has <laughs> been in this industry for 50 years. Um, so uh, tell us about your background. And it, 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 go go all the way back. Because you have a really cool gentlemen. story. Fabulous, Bob <laughs> Well, I... Uh, I trained as a musician and unfortunately always got yelled at for talking too much, which was training me for this. Um, and as a touring musician, I was a percussionist in some musical groups, started out with Roberta Flack in Washington, DC in the early seventies and then played with a band called Orleans, which was a Northeastern band that had a, a pretty good career and, uh, and eventually had to stage manage because nobody would deliver towels or water backstage. And somebody got elected. I got elected to be the nudge, to be the pusher. And that started me in my career of badgering promoters and venue people. Bob, mm -hmm. you played in Orleans? Yep. yep. Wow. I was a little guy in the middle. Wow. Well, there were two little guys. I was the littlest guy in the middle. And uh, we, uh, we toured and somebody had to get production aspects organized, I got elected. Uh, there were a few people involved, a couple of real wonderful professionals who I learned from who went to the Yale School of Drama and, and, uh, and, and Juilliard and other places. And uh, eventually I became a, a promoter rep in, in the greater Northeast working for Cedric Kushner Productions, 
uh, Concerts East, Concerts West, Ron Delsner, a few other people, and, and learned the production aspects of putting on shows and being involved. Uh, that he got a, a touring offer to work in the 70s for a Southern rock band called The Outlaws, uh, toured around with them, and then I think my career grew um, and improved, if you want to use that term. Um, ended up as a road manager and a production manager for Sammy Hagar and Van Halen, and road managed and tour managed Van Halen, and then road managed Tina Turner. Then I was the venue guy for uh, CPI uh, for the Rolling Stones, and uh, I, had a, I had a lot of wonderful touring jobs. Then I became a concierge at the Four Seasons Hotels in New York when I was off the road and got involved in the limousine business and went from the back seat to the front seat. And my, my, the limousine company that I worked for in New York was CLS, which has grown into another company nowadays. But back in the day, we, we, I helped build a music division that, that serviced concert touring bands. And with that, having traveled around, amassed a group of affiliates and built a music book and have affiliates all over the world that I've been dealing with for well over 25 years from a, a lot of different aspects. Started my own company in 2004 called Dates Personal Logistics in Columbus, Ohio. And about two years in, sold all the cars and became a broker because the car business didn't suit me as well as the talking part. <laughs> and the phone calling part. And we, uh, we have now um, a wonderful staff of seven people. They don't come from the industry, they come from the limousine industry, both. And we have upwards of 700 or 750 clients, of whom 650 of them at least are only entertainment clients. Concert touring bands, promoters, music and movie production companies, TV shows on MTV and other places. And we're, we're wonderfully, touch wood, we're wonderfully uh, established in our, in our industry. We have a wonderful market share, we're busy. We're not busy right now. Um, I don't think many people are, but we're, we're busy enough. And, uh, and that's what we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We look after people like you, we looked after people mm -hmm. like what I did, and, and and that's sort of what we do. How did I do that? And you do it well. <laughs> and when I even when I call you at like three in the morning, uh, <laughs> please, please call me at three in the morning. Um, I have. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the person to answer the phone. Um, and if if some of you people know me, then in ten or fifteen years, very few of you have ever left me a voicemail. Nope. So um, this is true. If you're in need, we want to be the people you call. So, Zan, um, you work for Rocket Cargo, who's one of the largest largest freight and logistic com bleh, can't speak today logistics <laughs> companies in the event industry. Um, tell us about your background and how you came to work in logistics and what your role is at Rocket right. Cargo. Um, I won't let you guys do the math and figure out how old I am. I'm hoping my young face makes me look <laughs> not my age. But um, I kind of came into it as a fluke thing. I was teaching swim lessons and to little kids, and I needed to grow up and get a job. And uh, I had dropped out of college all four years of trying it to go snowboard. So, um, <laughs> and <laughs> I, yeah, Mary Jo is good, good with that one. Um, and <laughs> My best friend at the time, her husband had uh, answered an ad at the LA Times for a job at Rocket Cargo. And he had been there for about a year and he called me and he said, hey, do you need a job? And I was like, yeah, I probably should grow up these days. And uh, so I got offered a job at Rocket Cargo and I was brought in to kind of help assist some of the senior agents that had been around for years and years. Um, and I just was hired to come on and do their accounting. So when a job was finished, I would grab the file off their desk and I would gather all the charges and put together an invoice for the client and hand it back to them. And my little job was done. And I ended up hitting it off with one of the senior agents um, by the name of Joe Ryan. 
And uh, we started working really, really well together. And I've been with him for 20 years now. So I've been doing freight for that long and I've grown up in the industry to say the least. And um, man, it's such a fun job. It's uh, always challenging, always new. And I mean, this industry is full of some of the most kind hearted souls that I've ever met. And uh, I've met some really great friends along the way. Nice. So I know. I, I, I'm a total freak for, especially your kind of logistics. I love it. It's like the big game of Tetris. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that game growing up. So. <laughs> and I think we're going to hand it off to, to five one to ask you a lot more questions about. Yeah, did we hear from Doug? We didn't hear from Doug yet. Doug we did Weiss. hear from Doug. He oh, let yeah. us Mark, off. Yes. Really have I, uh, have I just totally. <laughs> and I left the building. I'm like, well, I'm just, sorry, guys, not tracking. <laughs> I was Leftover kidding. champagne from. It's because you want to be on a jet. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It Are you buttering me up, Adrian? I think so. So, Zan, tell us uh, what Rocket Cargo does and the different types of freight moves that you guys do. So, we are a logistics company. Hey, there you go. Um, and so we specialize in moving freight around the world. Um, we use land, air, and sea. Um, so when, I mean, just to start it off, we, you know, production manager calls us and says, hey, we have a show over in Japan on such and such dates, and we have this amount of gear. Can we start planning the move? Um, and so we start moving forward at that point and we figure out what the best options are for them. We quote them, you know, if there's time, we'll quote them a, a sea freight rate. If it's air freight only, we'll, we'll get air freight rates together for them. Or if it's a really hot one, we'll, you know, look at charter options and stuff like that. So, but we also specialize in, in just ground movement as well. Not so much tour trucking, but more of the one-offs, the little, the little shipments that kind of have to happen around the country per se, or not even in the US, but around the world. But, you know, to think about tour startups and tour, you know, when a tour ends, you have riggers, you have carpenters, you have production managers and techs that, you know, you finish in say Chicago and all of their work boxes are somewhere and they call me and say, okay, we're gonna be at, finish up at this venue and we have a list of returns and, you know, we'll get all those routed out. So we use, um, we use commercial line haul options for those kinds of things um, or domestic shipments um, with air freight, we'll use commercial airlines. I just had a client play on Saturday night Saturday Night Live and you know we got the call Wednesday morning and we had the freight in our hands Wednesday afternoon and they were in New York the next day so and we just called up the airlines and said we have you know 4,000 pounds to move from LA to New York in the next day um, so we'll you know we'll we'll be the first call that somebody makes usually when freight needs to get across anywhere so just wanted to jump in and say uh, it always blows my mind even to this day how simple that process can be from my side like if i'm on tour and i'm busy i can flip my guy an email saying i need x to go from here to here here's the address here's the contact here's the time and it's done it's mm -hmm. that's that's my one email maybe a back and forth with the price and then all of this gear gets thrown on a truck it's it's all dealt with out of my hands and i know because i trust my my supplier my my logistics partner that it's just gonna arrive when it's supposed to and that's it's it's when you think about it it just blows my mind you know yeah. <laughs> Ke kevin roach's cell phone is like the bat phone <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and all it's, of ours are really honestly yeah. my kids no, not, you know, they're yeah. at all hours of the day. Yeah. It's ringing, it's buzzing. They're like, mom, work. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so Zan, what are some of the things that we, sp we spoke about this yesterday? What are some of the things that as 
everyone on this panel has been a production manager in some shape, form, or fashion. But doing stadium and large scale arena tours what are some things that we can do to kind of save money do the most shows but in the uh, shortest amount of time because yesterday you were talking about leapfrogging system yeah. so can you elaborate on that a little bit more for us um i can so we always want to give you guys all of the options and present you the most cost effective for you you know you guys all have budgets that you have to adhere to and um you know, the whole leapfrogging system kind of came into play. I don't know, maybe when I started seeing it was about 10 years ago. And, you know, it was multiple stops that just wasn't, didn't allow enough time to get there using commercial transportation. Um, so either trucking or commercial air freight. And so then you're starting to look at charters and the price just keeps going up and up. And so, you know, clients started looking at, well, what if I send two rigs, you know, I think this happens mostly in South America, or even in some parts of Asia, where, you know, it's a small little place, but if you have a show here and here on a map, the, the best option is leapfrogging, so you're not paying charter fees. And so you send two rigs down to wherever you're going, and you know, you just kind of leapfrog packages throughout the country and all these shows get done and you've got enough time to use a commercial option versus chartering, if that makes sense. I wish I could have a little map, but it's leapfroggings are a big headache. Uh, they get a little bit confusing and, but they're a great option. So um, we had a client who was doing a stadium tour and they had these steel packages that needed to get into the stadiums a week in advance. And so there was three steel packages that we shipped around the world for them. Um, so they were there well in advance to be put together and everything, so. I think the first leapfrog tour that I was ever a part of was the Metallica Summer Sanitarium tour of 20, 2000. It was a stadium tour, and that was the first time that I ever saw steel teams were leapfrogging. Mm. And then they had an A team, an A production team, a B production team, each with a production manager and a production coordinator, and so on. And then the Universal, yep. which was the band <laughs> and the the you know I guess I would call it the admin or executive party. It was really. I think that's that for me was when I fell in love with, with logistics mm -hmm. it was yeah. the most fascinating thing I had seen to date. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And yeah. Sometimes there is that universal package of small stuff, you know, their guitars that they want to do every single show with, you know, and so that will either, you know, do a small charter or we'll go on the planes with them. So can you leapfrogging off of no pun intended <laughs> off of off of what doug said earlier can you walk us through what goes on behind the scenes in a freight move like let's say if doug is he's up in montreal and he needs to do a show let's say miami florida tomorrow what's the process after doug sends an email to you what do you what's the, all the information you need from doug and then what do you need to do to accomplish it uh, you start praying <laughs> that there's flight options. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, the more thorough email or phone call that you get with all the specifics is going to help us be the best, or, you know, that'll help us be the best for you. Um, you know, so typically Montreal into the States, you're having to deal with customs. And so you got to figure out, is there a carne already in existence? Is the carne the best option? Um, you know, sometimes you look at into commercial invoices to clear shipments real quickly. Um, you know, does the customer have a continuous bond with us that we can act on their behalf? Um, do we do it as a temporary import? You know, so we start weighing out how are we going to handle the customs? Because as Rocket Cargo, we'll do that as well for you. Um, so we'll handle the pickup. We'll handle the export on in Canada. We'll make bookings with airlines and then we'll arrange the customs clearance in Miami and the transfer from the airport all the way to the delivery to the venue. And then we say, have fun. 
So do you use commercial airlines or do you use private charters? And what if there's a mechanical issue? What's the, the backup plan? So we do use a lot of the commercial options. Um, you know, we're using American Airlines, Delta, United, Virgin, British Airways, all of them, you know, to go anywhere in the world. Um, and, you know, if depending on if your freight is small enough, we can use narrow body flights. And if you've got a lot of freight, we're having to look at wide body options. Um, so we really try to utilize commercial options for say, you know, the smaller shipments and based on the time, but, you know, we've done, you know, we did Taylor Swift in 2018 and it was seven, seven forty sevens, you know, it was 580,000 kilos worth of freight. Um, so you're not going to be able to call a commercial airline and say, Hey, we need to move this freight. So we started booking charters for that. And so we work with companies like Atlas air charter. Um, we now have our own charter division with rocket, you know, another brokerage brokering part of us where, you know, we've got great contacts that are now booking the planes through Atlas, through other, you know, Singapore airlines, you know, other carriers that are you know, have planes for us to use. So. And what about shipping by sea? What are the advantages of that over shipping by ground or by air? Um, so shipping by sea is definitely your cheaper option. Uh, not in quality, but um, if you've got a lot of time on your hands to move stuff around, you can definitely utilize the whole sea freight option. Um, you know, so say you need to go New York to London and you have, you know, a month to get it there. You know, you can look at like a slow air option where you give us the freight and we call the airlines and say we have, you know, we have 12 positions to move over the next three weeks. Um, you know, or we can load a 40 foot container at our warehouse in New York and, um, you know, transit times, you know, are typically between you know, two to three weeks to go New York to London. Um, and that's inclusive of all your, all your port times, you know, you've got cutoff times at the port, you know, which is usually a day or two before the vessels scheduled to depart. Um, and, you know, and then you've got the customs clearance, customs exports, and then the customs import into say London or whatever. Um, a tricky thing is, and you kind of have to, speaking of, oh, maybe this was in the call yesterday, but fail, mechanicals or issues, uh, sea freight, you kind of have to have in the back of your head, what if my containers get pulled for exams, um, a customs exam, you know, randomly, uh, randomly customs will say, this container on this vessel, I want to pull it and I want to exam and you're at the mercy of US Customs. And, uh, you know, so you try to factor in some of that little leeway time and some of those things that just might happen. The, but, burning, question, the burning question is, when do you need to see it? Yes. And remember, you know, and remember, remember, we're talking about shipping things out and then returning them back. So sometimes you'll find that you've got an urgency to get stuff somewhere. Like for example, you know, this client that just did SNL, you need to get that gear as fast as possible to New York. However, they probably don't have a lot going on for the next however number of weeks. So perhaps on the way back, it's a slow truck to LA instead of a flight. Yep. So yep. these are the, you know, these, and, and we talk about, you know, for example, same, if anybody has done a show at Blaisdell in Honolulu, you got to bring your stuff with you. You definitely are potentially, maybe you're doing a play like Honolulu on the way in and out of Asia. So you may be flying your gear one way or the other there. And then perhaps on the way back, you're going to put it on a slow boat to save some money. You don't necessarily need it. The definition of a slow boat is in fact, you know, that's the, it happens when you, when you have a little bit of time and you want to save some money, shipping by sea is a very, very viable option. Very cost effective um, as well. One of the, I, I, you know, I, I remember a conversation that I had in a very, very difficult time where we thought we were, 
we had a delay in artists and we thought, well, we'll put things on a boat overseas and it'll take six weeks. And by the time things straighten out, the stuff will be there. And, and that's, you know, how we do things. Yeah. Thank you, Zan. Um, I just wanted to make one quick point before you go ahead, Adrian, yep. sorry, real quick. Yeah, yeah, for sure, um, for sure. Because one thing that a lot of tour managers struggle with in their earlier times is when they need to start using freight. Because mm -hmm. let's say you're with a baby band, they have a couple guitars, maybe a couple ped small pedal boards, cymbals. It's really not that problematic to go commercial with that. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to be easier for you. Um, but let, and you know, let's say you have more gear that needs to be moved. It becomes problematic to start taking that through, you know, first of all, taking it through the airport, getting it to and from the airport, if it's any volume and weight. Um, and then the overage charges will start to get silly. On top of that, if you're taking regional small planes, let's say I did a hop from Vancouver up to Whitehorse, which is, a, a, you know, very small. I think it's a 16 seater plane. And there was a real struggle. They didn't get all of our fly gear on. Um, so situations like that, freight is is such a convenient option if you can afford it, because most likely what will happen is you will load out of your pre if you're already on the tour, you will load out your previous show, a truck will come, you'll put all the fly pack aside, you'll put it on the, the truck. And we're, you know, we're talking small tours here, um, theater tours, club tours, you know, let's say you have 30, 30, 40 pieces that goes on the truck, the truck disappears, that gear will arrive at where you designated it, whether it's TV, the next show, or your rehearsal space, whatever. So it's super convenient. Um, all the all the shit is handled. So when you go to the airport and you fly yourselves, you're just dealing with personals and your artist. So you know, but there are times where you know you might be it, you might have a couple of pieces, and it just makes more sense to to take your stuff with you on the. On I the I did want to point out. I was just thinking about this when you were talking about that, Doug. Is if you go back to our case studies, <laughs> you talk about a situation where you did check fly gear to save some money. And it got lost. So it is something that it might be, you know, working, like you said, when is it time to work with a freight forwarder? It's, it's, yeah. it's return on investment. You well, know, it might, he, you may think it costs a little more, but you know, at the end of the day, you may end up more into your budget or and, into your contingency. And that speaks to those conversations you have to have with management where right. they might initially be reticent to uh, pay a little more to have it go freight until something blows up in, in all of our collective faces and we realize the gear is not there. And, and it, it's a, you know. We also, we also would be remiss if we didn't say the word South America <laughs> while we're talking about freight forwarding and cargo movements. Because the truth of the matter is, is that if you're doing a big tour in South America, you are not doing it without your freight forwarder as your logistical partner in these moves. You can't get there from here. You just can't. So at some point in a South American tour, you're going to have to get on with your freight forwarders because you can't always move uh, by land, you don't have the time, you might have to get in it, you might have to put your gear, you know, there, there are so many other, there's so many logistical um, variables in international touring. In South America, sometimes, you know, you've got to, uh, in Europe, if you've got to get in and out of Russia, you may or may not be able to truck over depending it's seasonal. There are lots of different times when your freight forwarder, your cargo people become your logistical partners in moving your gear. And we can, we're going to talk a little, just to uh, at least ask a question that was basically answered about when your logistics companies are also moving people. Um, we're going to touch a little bit more on that later, but just to say for that, Basically, if you've got a, a, a one-off or an award show or something that pops up on a day off where you've got to get everybody somewhere else that is not able to be done in a traditional manner, you're going to look to your logistics company. Sometimes your logistics 
your, you know, your freight forwarders and your jet guys might have to reach across the aisle to one another and work together because we're not always going to have the, it's not going to be cost effective always to move parties differently. Sometimes you got to put the act, the B party and the C party and the gear on one vehicle to move. So that, is there anything else we want to touch on in this uh, segment of logistics before wanted, we get into ground i wanted to throw a good example out there is a lot of a lot of tours have their buses going in different directions after wraps so a new new york city can be can be a little tricky at some points earlier this year we we had to go through rocket to to get our gear outs from the venues as the buses and trucks were leaving after our show so that's a good example to throw out there for anyone who's like on a first bus tour you may see your buses go in a different direction and you have all your gear on you and you got to get that moved either to LA or, you know, Nashville, wherever your, your productions hubbed vendors, et cetera. That's a good example of if your logistics team coming in, coming in when you, when you really need them in the clutch, when tours wrap like that. Bob dates, dates, personal logistics. Daisy. It's yeah. good to see you, my friend. Let's talk about how we do cars. So, um, Bob mentioned earlier when he was introducing himself to all of us that he previously owned cars, didn't love being in the car business and uh, became a broker. And, and you talk about affiliates. So I, you and I have worked together on many, many tours, many, many runs. Um, I understand the concept of an affiliate. Can you explain that, first of all? how a broker works, why I would use you instead of doing the cars myself. And you and I can chat through that because we have this in a real life experience. And what do, what is the functionality? What's the function of, of your affiliates? <clears throat> well, a broker is, um, and Dave is also the same. Uh, Dave actually wears two hats in his charter business. They Doug, own Doug, 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 it's Doug. <laughs> Doug, 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 Doug. I'm thinking there's another Dave, a bro. But Doug's, Doug's wife. Uh, Doug's Doug, the other black guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was the only one. <laughs> Doug wears two hats. He owns planes and he books other other other, other aircraft. A broker um, is someone who finds a finds an entity or, or or a piece of equipment that he doesn't own and and, and resells it. So essentially in, in, a, in a wholesale retail term, I'm a reseller, but the brokers in my industry don't own cars anymore and rely on an affiliates network. An affiliate is another, is a company that does have equipment um, to, to provide the service. I have toured before, therefore I have tailored my means, my revenue stream to suit the needs of, of a touring entity so that you're not paying a wholesale to retail markup. You're paying, except for my administration, administrative fees. And, and um, I, I try to keep my markups low. I try to keep my profit margin low and base my, my revenue stream on volume. Um, and uh, what, I, what, what I refer to as an affiliate there's a company anywhere in the world, in the U.S., in Canada, and uh, South America. Oh, by the way, Adrian, Adrian I think we should, specify, we should qualify that South America, contrary to geographical belief, con South America begins at the bottom of Texas when it comes to the, the logistical nightmare of traveling. What, if, you, right. if, you, um, you know, if you own a, your own personal car and you go to Mexico, you have to get separate insurance in order to go into Mexico to be covered. Same thing applies in, in cargo, in limousines, in anything. It's a different world below Texas. Um, but um, the affiliates that I deal with are companies that are generally well-established, well-recognized in their field, and if not already experienced in handling entertainment clients and entities, um, they will be usually after the first job after dealing with our company because we use, we will go through a painstaking process of screening that company, 
finding out what they do, how, what their general business practices, how they perceive my type of business, and how they how they promise to to execute that business. And if we get a good feeling about it, we move on. Otherwise, we try to find another affiliate in the marketplace. If you don't get a warm, fuzzy feeling about somebody you're going to deal with, perhaps you shouldn't. And we try to provide an affiliate network in my industry um, that makes you guys feel comfortable in your inside your little inside your community, as opposed to somebody who might call a taxi company or a limo company that doesn't understand what backstage is. For me, there is no front door. My, my database always says backstage entrance on it, as do yours, as do the, the bus companies, as do um, a charter delivery. If you, you know, as a charter company for jets and, and people, you may have to book ground transportation. You want to make sure if you're, if you're transporting talent or if you're transporting gear, that, sh that does not pull up in front of the circular driveway in front of the Fort Wayne Municipal Auditorium. It needs to go backstage. And we don't, we don't have a front door in our lexicon. Um, so does that give you what you're, you're looking for, Adrian? I think it does. And I think let's just take two minutes to chat a little bit about when we would use a logistics, a personal logistics service such as yourself or when we would go straight and book cars. Um, I do a lot of work with females and my females generally have children. So the family dynamic on They're tour the these days, can, right? pardon? They're the only ones who can. You know, the, 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 the uh, family dynamic on tour is becoming quite, um, uh, the norm these days. So those types of dynamics, it's different than just the band, you know, you've, you've got kids and they got to go somewhere and things like that. So you're looking at having generally a different number of cars. Um, for me, you know, there are times when I will book my own cars, if it's going to be a straightforward situation, and maybe I need one vehicle, and perhaps it's going to be about, you know, a, a show call vehicle, and it's fairly straightforward. I will definitely try to book my own cars. Sometimes I'm going to split it up around the country. There's a wonderful company called AJL Transport out of Dallas, Maddie Johnston and his brother. They mm -hmm. do also a similar situation. And sometimes it's a regional scenario where I'm going to have several dates in Texas and I want one re responsible person in that state because here's the thing. When you start to do personal logistics and ground, local drivers are important. Not, you know, not having a company that, that migrates their drivers in from somewhere else. Because remember, when you're, when you're moving pop stars in cars, you've got to have a driver that knows the area and knows alternative routes in case evasive, evasive maneuvers need to happen. There's traffic, someone gets noticed, you know, you're talking about safety. So you want pro drivers. And when you call people like Bob Dates or, you know, the other companies that do personal logistics who also work together, you're making sure that you have put a bit of a clearinghouse into place for quality control. Your car's windows are gonna work. Some artists are very specific about their cars. They like a certain vehicle. They want the tint to be a certain way. They need a certain type of driver, not too chatty, not asking for, um, you know, not asking for autographs and disturbing the talent, photos, things like that, right? So when you use a vendor that's known to you that works in this business, you're giving yourself a little bit of, of um, a comfort zone. And for sure, there are times where I will say to Bob, hey, Bob, can you call Leonard in Chicago? Will you call Butch in San Francisco? Will you call those guys? Bob knows what's needed and Bob does the advance, especially if it's multiple cars. Well, that's what Zan was saying. And that's what Doug originally said about the comfort factor of making one phone call. Um, the the irony of all these industries. And, and, and Doug, I don't know if you, you've heard the expression, we're all trying to charter the same aircraft. At the end of the day, there are certain markets 
that use that are that that are best serviced by certain companies, no matter what. And when you call Matt Johnson or Michael Johnston in Dallas, remember those guys learned from their father Neil. Right. Started back when when Irving Azoff was was carrying ice cubes, and I don't think he ever carried ice cubes. But <laughs> you know the the fact is there are industry leaders. That's right. There are industry pioneers. Right. And um, if I can find a pioneer who's still in the business, then they're naturally automatically going to be a leader. Um, right. You know when 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 David goes to Paris with with an artist. There are three companies to use, but I found a fourth one. And, and 25 years later, those guys are still pretty good. And because they're a little bit more business-like and a little less, I hate to, I'm a, I'm, I don't want to use this word often, but, but a little bit more groupy-like versus business-like, my business-like company people love because guys get in the car and they don't know who the pop star is. They just know where the backstage entrance is. So I've been very fortunate to build my own network and 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 have a certain criteria that it that on on any given day might have a few more trick questions in our questionnaire that can that can find a better suited guy than uh, a company than 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 maybe everybody else uses but more often than not adrian you're you're absolutely right when you're going to go to chicago and you're going to go to dallas you're going to go to miami there are going to be the same companies that we use day in day out right. <clears throat> it's about well, it's about to move let's, somebody. Right. And and let's let's share a couple of tips and tricks about cost savers. As cars can be expensive. They are necessary, but there's a way to do it so that you are, you know, the, the thing about booking cars is you want to make sure that the needs are covered, but or bills having vehicles clicking away hours and hours at a time, sitting in front of a hotel, sitting in a venue when you know that no one is going anywhere. Now, right. there's you've. This is the part where we spend a lot of time talking about the just in case sale. How much money do you spend on that just in case who shows up on various rooming lists and things like that? Right. So Bob, let's talk about a couple of the real solid tricks for and cars on standby, but not burning dollars the whole time. Let's talk about that split ticket we talked about yesterday. Well, first of all, I think one important um, one important key phrase to avoid is "Don't worry, I'll take care of it," um, because if if you hear that, that means somebody may not really be like you said, cognizant or, or concerned with the bottom line. Um, use somebody you know and trust who may very well be able to relate to your budgetary needs, to your budgetary constraints. Uh, I, I know that. I've, I've been grilled by tour accountants when I was a tour manager. I know why nobody wants to see an $1,100 bill for two transfers. And like you said, the term split ticket in, 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 many, in many industries implies exactly what it is. Pick up at the airport or pick up at the hotel, bring to the gig. And then at the end of the night, go from the gig back to the airport or the hotel or to another gig at the end of the night if you work for Prince and you work till five o'clock in the morning. Um, but, you know, those things are the things that people who are industry friendly can relate to and, and all, also always be conscious of because at the end of the day, everybody's worried about their money. Even the people who quote unquote, don't really care about the budget, don't really care about the bottom line. If you save them money day in, day out, you get that question less often th than other companies do because they know I'm looking out for your money or they know that, that Matthew Johnson is looking out for your money. They know that other people in other parts of the world, Ian Massey or Manfred Frank, or um, not necessarily Udo's brother-in-law who owns a limo company in Tokyo, but you know there are companies where we know the pitfalls of being a one-stop service and how to avoid them. You know, if you right. want to book a tour city by city, show by show, 
then there are only so many companies in the world that you could really book that through. Right. So when we talk about only cars and split tickets, you know, standby cars are are, are a thing. They 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 are going to happen. How it, how do we minimize the damage on a standby car rather than booking a car for fourteen whole hours and having it there for fifteen hundred dollars a day? Hmm. Safety. We check Sa the we we check the mini. We checked, okay. what's, what's the mini? What's, what's that car's mini gonna be? And, right. and I, my yeah. suggestion to people is always check your mini and then talk to the artist team. If it's the personal assistant, is it the nanny? Who it's, it might, might be, again, to, to JP's uh, point about security, sometimes the personal security lead is the person that you call and say, listen, we're gonna put a car, we're gonna spot a car. I'm giving you guys the car for fours. If you need to get out and do some things, try to do that. If you feel like you're going to go to dinner or something else is going to happen, let me know. Perhaps we release it and call one later. The best thing I can advise to not burn money, having cars sitting around arbitrarily, is to develop a little bit of a system, talk to your artist team and say, hey, we're trying. Now, look, I'm going to. I'm going to just stop and say one thing. You can try and do this. You do the best you can with it. And hopefully you're able to minimize some bleeding. And sometimes it works. Do yeah. not be upset if you have to spot a car all day. And that's just the way it works out sometimes. Yeah. You but do the best you honestly, can. You do the best you can to try and micromanage it. But please don't spend your entire day figuring out how to save money on you know you want to do it you definitely there are ways to do it you do the best you can but don't get stuck there folks don't get stuck there interesting um, what else what else bob well interesting point adrian the fact is you got to be honest when you communicate with your clients and and the and the and the booker you being the a, a, tour, a tour manager as is, to me as a booker has to be honest to me and and if you want to save the money and then and i want to be helpful in that process You've got to be honest with amongst yourselves. So when you say to to reach out to a nanny or a personal security or or someone like that, for me as a vendor, I need to be right up front with those people and say the tour manager or the tour accountant or the or the business want me to help try and save money on on the on that end or on my end, and. A, a personal security guard may want a car every second of every minute of every day because they're concerned with certain risk factors or exposures. But but a good but a personal security guard will be able to look at a day, and and and, and I as a vendor will should be able to look at a day and find out when that vehicle, when that just in case vehicle, or or we call it a, a, a you know a, a, a last resort escape car or anything the now the shadow vehicle the shadow vehicle right but um when it's most vital and when it can and when it may very well be best utilized and and the only real time you're looking at is during the afternoon of a of a in from a in the in this in the schedule of a venue you don't really need an escape car before there's uh, be, before the doors open per se because you can always get out it's easier to get out it's easier to get away um, so if you're going to save money and, and and a band comes over to a venue at, at noon or one or two and sound check is at four or five there's a three or four hour gap before the doors open and the show begins when you can actually save money uh, on days off when you have families traveling then maybe a, you have to ask personal staff nannies and whatever um, if they're making plans, if everything is spontaneous, you're right. Spontaneity breeds waste of money. Spontaneity is not the most economical way to plan a tour when you leave home. But if you have a family and you have kids and you have nannies and they're, and, and they're starting to pass a cold around or this or that, you might need cars on site for medical, medical treatment or medical attention or things. So there are ways to save money. And, and, and I think I think interaction and cooperation is, is communication, vital. Right, communication and attention to detail amongst and, all the parties. And right. sometimes when you get to know your artist, that you sometimes there's just that, you know what, this is going in the budget. 
it's going to sit there for 12 hours. That's right. what they do. And some right. days they use it and some days they don't. And you gotta roll the dice. Right. It's, you know, sometimes it's but just about knowing your, your artist, you know, right. or, or like you said, you may have an artist that between sound check and the show wants to go antique shopping or Thrifting. something. And, right. I was going to say, right, antique yeah. Shopping, and, and, it, and like, yeah. you know, it's like there, there comes a time where it's just like, you can't fight yeah. it because you know right. what, if there's anything I've learned about ground transportation is Murphy's yeah. law. Right. is in full effect it's like the minute you think oh they're never going to use it and you don't get a car for to just sit there and wait for that day off they're going to need exactly. i mean you're in denver mary joe there's a there's an artist um I, I won't mention any names but his initials are rod stewart and, and, <laughs> everybody has a hobby everybody has a hobby his hobby is model trains so the same chauffeur drives him every year and the same chauffeur knows that after sound check they're going to the model train shop which right. closed after well, 50 years or something. Yeah, anyway. the pearl I know which one though. You know one? <laughs> oh yeah, so it's famous. There, there are little things like that that are, right. that are great. And, and Doug Wilson said something, used a term actually interesting about blowing up. Um, and again, if you're, a, if you're a baby band, you don't know the day that your album or your career is gonna blow up. But the fact is, the fact is when that happens, your car, the complexion of your car vehicle usage changes dramatically. Right. And we'll get, well, I'm sure we'll get to that too, because you know, you may do, you may be the third act on a three act show. And the next, the day after, the day after that Saturday night show, you've got to fly to New York because you're doing Jimmy Fallon or, or, or somewhere else on Monday night. So my business gets incrementally busier for lack of a better word or harder. And when and and so does Zan and so so does Doug because your 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 career just went from from twenty three foot camper to forty five foot tour bus and TV shows and who knows what. Doug, about go ahead, go ahead, Doug, go ahead, real, go ahead. Um, and and at that level where we're talking in between blowing up and and you know we're not talking massive established artists here, but. Like we've said on many, many, many topics, it's important to have this conversation with your management and your artist as to whether they want cars or not, or what their needs are going to be in advance. I've been on multiple bus, multiple truck arena tours where the artist is fine to wander around and get Ubers themselves. They just, they don't want to spend money on that. So, you know, if they turn up and you're spending money on three cars sitting there for them, they're going to be pissed. So it's important that you establish early what their needs are going to be. And, and be willing to adapt to their needs if they change. Let's say there's a big show going on in, in New York and they might need a car that night. So um, don't just assume you need to have the conversation in advance. Um, oh no, definitely have the conversation, don't assume it, but definitely yeah. be, and not be afraid to have the conversation. That's why tour managers ask me how much it's gonna cost. I've, I've, I've definitely taken the, to the, to, you know, to, I've taken the habit of saying to my artist, let's talk about cars. How do you want to do this? If we spot a car out there all day long, you're going to spend $1,500 a day. Let's say we're going to just put them out in the evening, or you're going to let me know the day before. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Then you, then you're giving them an opportunity. If, and they're either going to have that conversation with you or say, no, just put them out there. Bob, before we move on, I'd like to have you just, let's chat for a second about the sharing of information because we chatted yesterday about, you know, the fact that perfect example is the relationship that you and I freely have when I may or may not know your affiliates in the market. I may or may not have their contact information, but there's going to be times when things are happening fast and hard in the middle of the day, night, or, 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 you know, moving very quickly, Bob, and yesterday you shared with us and you shared information with me. You will take yourself out of the loop and say, Adrian, here's your contact. For anything that is up to the moment, call this dispatcher. Talk about why that is a way that you practice. Well, I think it stems from a deeply emotional trait of security versus insecurity, <laughs> for one thing. And, if I, and, and being an old fart and being in this business a long time, um, if I, I mean, again, proprietary knowledge should always be analyzed before it's kept. And I don't feel compelled to be that company 
that keeps that it keeps my information from my client or from my customer or my or because the minute you don't know who it is and it says well we got to call bob date we got to call date's personal logistics to find out how close the car is because that's the because that's the level of communication i set up I lose a, an element of trust from my client. You as tour managers and, and anyone on this call or anyone in this business knows that our business does have a certain amount of spontaneity and urgency that is unpredictable. And therefore, when I open up an affiliate relationship with another company, I want as much information as I can get. And when you open up a relationship with my company, and my team will give you as much information as possible in order to make you look as smart as you as you need to be and as smart and, and enable you to be as smart as you have to be to be one step ahead or straight in real time. So communication is vital um, with the vendor, with the price, with the chauffeur information. And I use the term chauffeur because drivers, in my industry, drivers have to be chauffeurs. They can't just be drivers. They have to be, there's a certain level of service, which of course is accompanied by a certain level of price. And, and for anyone listening, the price, the, the vehicles are separated by small, like in Doug's business, there's, there's small, medium and large body or small cabin, medium cabin, large cabin. Ours are sedans, um, MPVs, multi-passenger vehicles, which are looked at in the industry by continent as SUVs in America, or Vianos and V-Class and minivans in other parts of the world, larger, larger van vehicles that are the old fashioned window vans, the, the Ford Transit, the Mercedes Sprinter, the Dodge Ram, the Nissan, and then buses. And buses come in every shape, size, and configuration from 19 passenger mini coaches that you see at airport rental vehicles up to 55 and 60 passenger coaches. So I want you all as my clients to know who's driving it, who's providing the service, what time it's set up. And that's why software is important in my industry so that you get all the, the vital reservation and confirmation software and all the chauffeur alerts and all the this and that. So com communi communication is king. And I will not, as and my company will not. Do we lose? Them? I'm worried about somebody stealing my client. I'm in right. a relationship with that client, right. and right. I'm worried about the client trying to do business with that with that company in, in a different city direct. When I don't know about it, then I don't have a great relationship with that vendor. So right. communication. It's is all about it's all about relationships. It's about how much. And what form you deliver that information? Okay, one one more quick point to make to to folks uh, to the students and folks watching about billing and, and cars, guys. Sometimes you're going to have show cars and show call cars for your artist and your writer, and it's a show cost. Sometimes if that artist wants to go clubbing between the end of the show and bus call, that goes to you. You've got a, an opportunity here to also make sure that your billing is correct when you're using personal logistics companies. You can break Bob Bob's brain by telling him how to split the billing between maybe the promoters in each city for the show call cars and the personal or family cars are gonna go to the artist. And when you've got somebody like Bob and his company fielding that situation, the billing is less of a nightmare for you as well. Split billing becomes easier and it's not such a big nightmare. Easy. And now we're going to talk about jets. <laughs> we were waiting for <laughs> this that's one. That's a whole nother level, ladies and gentlemen. Over Doug. to Mark and Doug. Doug, let's let's get Air Charter kick, kicked off because I know you have a lot of information to share with our students. Um, why is Air Charter important, and why is why is it a touring tool, not just a luxury? Yeah, I mean, there's a luxury element. Um, for all their charter. Skipping TSA is a huge luxury, right? But, you know, a lot of my clients um, use as a tool as an income generator. It really is. Um, I do a lot of DJ work um, and DJs have the benefit of traveling with a laptop or a thumb drive and they can do two or three shows in a night. For New Year's, that's happened multiple times. We'll have them up in the snow. They'll be in Vegas for a show and they'll end something in LA. And they'll do three different shows and you just can't do that type of stuff 
with Southwest. So it really allows them to travel a lot farther, a lot faster. Um, and there's a lot of, to it. I mean, if you have somebody on the show, why you would choose a private jet? I mean, there's things from the airports you can use. There's another 2000 airports available exclusively for private jets that you couldn't use commercially. So that really helps out a lot. Um, smoking's a big thing. A lot of my artists make sure they're smoking on planes. You can only do that on private jets, as far as I know, unless things have changed commercially. Um, that's there. Um, sleep is a huge one. Um, getting off of a busy show where you're tired and you can go to a plane and the bed's made for you and you can pull in and sleep, so much more comfortable even than a first class lead on a, on a commercial aircraft. Um, eating options is another one I hear about a lot. Um, if you have restricted eating where you can only eat certain things or you like certain stuff in certain areas, you can go to any local restaurant. We can cater that to the plane. You can order special catering, um, allergies, stuff like that. It's all taken account for. Um, another really big one that I think gets mentioned almost never is luggage. Uh, we don't have the problem of losing your luggage because it's it's sitting right behind your seat. So there's no commercial issues with losing luggage when you do with stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, you're avoiding the general public, which a lot of artists need to, avoiding paparazzi. Um, there's so much security we can put in place for you, whether you're boarding the aircraft inside a, a terminal or inside a uh, hangar so no one can see you when you get on to making sure that uh, there's bathrooms on both sides of the aircraft. So even the flight attendant's not bothering you or your family while you're flying on the plane. But there's luxury reasons uh, to, to fly, but there's also just the uh, logistics and the efficiencies of, of flying and, and to really save the most amount of money on the tour. All really, really great points. And, and I had some festivals that really hit me right off the top of the head. You were talking about that run. I was thinking about, um, was it Snow Globe and Tahoe? Yeah, and maybe a decadence exactly. in Denver and kind of bouncing around uh, the states during New Year's can get pretty crazy. So a right. charter, a charter definitely comes in handy when you when you're playing three or four shows in one night, and it's crazy. You pray for that weather to be good to you in, uh, up in the mountains there, but yeah. Um, what are what are some basics our students need to know? I know you'd mentioned a couple of things uh, on, on a list we had thrown together here with private jets. Can you talk a little bit about like the differences between like light mid? Uh, yeah. super mid jets, uh, safety ratings, things like that, and the kind of the protocols around jets and their sizes? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, you have the, the, the basic sizes of a light, a mid, a super mid, a heavy jet, but then they even go farther. You can go into ultra long range, which typically the same size as heavy jets, but can go internationally. Uh, and then regionals, which we should talk about for a few minutes in a bit. But it's interesting. And then Prior to light jets, you have turboprops. Some artists just are super uncomfortable being on a turboprop. They're much slower. They typically hold between five and eight passengers. Um, they're great for short hops. And by short hops, I mean anything within about an hour. Anything longer than that, uh, they burn so much fuel by being inefficient with the propellers that they're not even cost efficient compared to a light jet. Light jets, um, as a tour manager would think, uh, you know, you're looking at five to six passengers but very light on luggage as well. So you always got to think about all the extra luggage for those. Mid-size is just a step up, I would say between five and eight passengers. Super mid between let's say seven and 10. Once you get to super mid, you're getting into the category that can fly from LA to New York. So you can fly across the country. Those typically have a range for about five to six hours. So you're avoiding fuel stops at that price at that point there. And then heavy jets, which is typically what we book for tours. Those run anywhere from 10 seats to 18 seats. Um, and those are available with the range typically between six hours or so. Ultra long range can go up to 14. And then one thing that, you know, people don't think about a lot, especially when they call me, I always kind of surprise them with this, is the regionals and how popular the regional jets are when we do them privately. They're typically done in a commuter configuration where everybody's kind of facing forward. It's not a luxury option. But when you're moving crew, it's a really cost-effective option. If you have 30 crew members and you're putting on them on a private regional plane, you can follow the, the A party typically in a much smaller private jet or into a heavy jet. And per seat, it's really not that much different than what you're paying anyway if you would book it with a commercial airline. Not to mention they have really great storage bins so if you're doing something where you have a one-off with Google or with Walmart, you can put a lot of gear in the base of those planes. So um, that's a really nice option for those as well. Um, and then as far as safety rating, you mentioned that Mark, um, Argus is a great, Argus, uh, Wyvern and Isbeo are kind of the three we use in the States, uh, not as popular in Europe, but in the States. 
And what's important to know about safety ratings is really that it's not just the operator, the person managing the fleet that you're getting the rating on, you're actually getting a rating on the mechanics that work on the plane. You're getting a report history of where they've flown, if they've had any instances in the past. And then with the pilots, you're gonna see trip type, uh, trip in, I'm sorry, time and type and time as a pilot. So you'll know that he's been a pilot for 50 years, but if you're in a G450, uh, maybe he's only flown that for a hundred hours. So it's good to know time and type versus just how long he's been in the plane. And all that comes in the reports that you can ask for from your jet broker when you're booking a plane. Uh oh. Yeah, I, are we back here? Uh, I lost uh, you there. Can you see that one side? That was saying there was a good question here. What? How long? When? When should? When should a, a tour manager reach out to you um, in regards to booking a charter if they wanted to get a private jet per se? What? What do you think is the the best window to reach out? Yeah, I mean, with when you're doing charters, time's always going to be your friend when it comes to cost. Um, especially if you're doing anything international. Uh, too bad Henry's not here. Henry and I just did a tour in Australia last year. And, um, you know, Australia's winter being our summer and vice versa. I think he had a New Year's show and we booked that back in June. And the reason we booked it so early is the limited inventory you have there um, really creates a kind of a bidding frenzy as you get closer to the touring dates. So the more time you can give us, um, I know that's not always gonna be available as far as pop-ups and last minute flights, but if you're booking a tour out and if we can have four weeks with it, it helps us gather options, tell the operators of these, these fleet managers what's coming up and what to expect and really present you the best options. Now that can always be done. I know there's pop-ups and I know people need to go places last minute and we're there for that. But really, if you can give us anywhere from a month to six weeks to plan out a full tour, that's fantastic. For a one-off, if somebody's going to New York or somebody's going out to LA for something, I mean, that can be done within 24 hours. But when you're really looking at an extended routing, uh, at least a month would be helpful. I just want to point out, um, to tack onto that answer, that when you're doing a tour, Remember that the jets, jet inventory, and there's less, less jets than there are buses. Yeah. If your artist has a particular type or, or, or weight, heavy jet, light jet, if they've got certain planes they won't get on, you're best served to try and get your particularly, again, like jets, your summer touring, you want to put your vehicles in place. And that includes finding which plane you're going to use and making sure that somehow you can do that. Because I have been in a situation where I took, I have an artist that chooses planes and we send all of the information over. You know, it's a little bit disappointing to have to tell us that has chosen what they think is going to be their most comfortable situation that it's gone. So you want to be able to have a lot of choices. This affects your price points. It affects uh, 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 the available aircraft. It affects the crew. These are all re safety rates, whether the, the, the jet has been refurbished or not. These are all things you want to look at and you want to have more options than less. So if you know you're going to need them, start fishing for them early. It's the same thing as a bus, but they're going to go away. The good ones are going to go fast. Yeah, especially on tour routing. I mean, that's where you can really get limited options. And let's say we have 4,000 aircraft available in the country. The ones that actually work on tours that can be a, a larger size aircraft that can do what we call short hops within 45 minutes to an hour flight, it's really limited. So you get those, you have owner approval you gotta look at, safety ratings, crew experience. Once you dwindle it down, it's a very limited inventory that can really be available for you for a full tour. And then you have competition that comes in. So realistically, like we said, maybe a month would be would be best to really make sure you have all the options you need. Doug, continuing on, um, what should a tour manager expect from their jet broker? What should a TM look for in their jet broker? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I hate to say it, it's kind of cliche, it really experience. Um, you know, we at Quantum Jets, we kind of have that hybrid model. Bob was talking about that earlier. So we manage a fleet of, of jets are, that are our own, but we're also a broker. So it's, it's really just the experience. We see other brokers come to us for our planes and we kind of see what they've asked, not really looking at crew duties, not asking the right questions. Um, so it's really important that you know what uh, a tour looks like 
kind of been there before, what an international tour looks like, um, and kind of know what bumps to kind of expect coming up. We do a ton of sport, we do a ton of film, and we do a ton of you know, corporate business. And it's just drastically different. I, I always dream of the day where I can have those corporate clients that say they're going to be there at three o'clock and show up at three o'clock and, and go off on their flight where I have the, uh, you know, the, uh, the rock stars that kind of do the opposite, but it's always, grass is always greener. But, you know, experiencing that, knowing um, how to make people look good is really important. Um, I very rarely work directly in a few occasions, but with the actual lead passengers, um, it's either a tour manager or, you know, an executive assistant or what have you. And to have done it before and have the ability to show them, keep them shining in the eyes of their principal really, really helps. Um, you know, it, certain things I do just to make the things flow better, uh, call out time's important. If, if I am talking to Henry for a flight, I'll call him an hour before, let's say the plane's not in position yet. So it's not in the, in the town they're leaving from. So the plane's positioned in, he'll get a text from me or a call from me saying, Henry, plane's in position, uh, crew's ready for you. Uh, meaning, meaning the plane's fueled, it's ready to go. Uh, whatever special catering order is on there. It's the Greek food and you ask for extra tzatziki sauce. Tzatziki sauce is on there. So an hour before he leaves the venue, he knows catering's there, crew's ready for them, plane's fueled, I can pull up and go. So little things like that. Um, tarmac access is a big one on the tour side. Pulling a, a bus directly up to a plane is allowed at some spots. And when you can, it's all too convenient. But knowing when you can, you can't pull it up. If the artist needs to be walking through an FBO, it's a big difference as far as pulling the cars through and having them walk out to the plane or get on one of those little buggies out the plane. Now, can you explain um, to everyone an, what an FBO, FBO can you what an FBO oh, sure. is? Yeah. So thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Uh, so an FBO is uh, it's it's a it's the private section of the air, of the airport. So it's the airports will have multiple, and I'll show you actually in a minute um, a trip sheet that kind of explains this a little bit better. But when you go to an FBO, what you'll get from me is a trip sheet that lays out when you're leaving, what your tail number is, your crew, your crew information, contact information, and your FBO information. So that's where you're going to drive to. There's two ways of handling it. The situation can go, well, you come up to the front of the FBO, everybody exits a car there, they go through with their luggage, and then walk out to the aircraft. Or if you're fortunate enough, you can get tarmac access, which you pull up to the local gate they'd follow you out with a, you know, a little golf cart to the plane to make sure nobody's running into anything. And you can, you can board right there. But the FBO is, is the private side of the airport where you're going. And, and know this, there's multiple air, FBOs at airports. So it's not like there's just one. You can't say, take me to the FBO. You have to say, take me to Signature, take me right. to Atlantic, what have you. And that way you know where you're going. And all that will be on your trip sheet uh, prior to departure. Um, matter of fact, why don't I just pull up that trip sheet? Is that okay? Do you guys want to see? Yeah, that'd be, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah. Please do. You should, and, it should be on. You should be able to do it easily. And while, while Doug is pulling up his amazing trip sheet, I <laughs> want to just point out to folks who haven't done jet travel before that you don't just charter a jet and that's the end of your day problem solved. We have the same type of situations with jets as we do now with buses and timing. The timing, the duty time that this, the, the start and end to that aircraft day is now very similar to the way we have to look at buses. So you don't just have a jet and have the luxury of this plane standing by on a tarmac waiting for your artist to make it, not make it. If you are hubbing, if this is not a flight that goes from one city to the other, not a move forward, if you're hubbing, this, and this is why we use jets quite a bit in this business. An artist needs to hub out of a city for a personal preference or perhaps a reason. Once Doug talks about this trip sheet, I want to have him explain a little bit about the duty times and the things that make it a little bit more complicated and that it's not just a plane sitting on a runway waiting for you 24 seven. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely critical. Um, so I appreciate you bringing, bringing that up. Trip sheet should look as basic as this. Can you guys see this? What I, I pull mm -hmm. up here? Okay, yeah, great. we can yeah. see so, it. So it's, it, this is a basic trip sheet. This is one we did last year. Um, but the information you'll have, which is important, is obviously a picture of your aircraft. When you're being pulled out, you want to identify what it looks like so you know that. We'll also make sure that there's a layout of the seating configuration so you can know where your artist wants to sit. If he wants to have a bed made, we'll show you what it looks like in bed form versus seats where they can convert those over. 
really important, your tail number. You'll need that kind of everywhere you go. So when you pull into an FBO, you'll say, here's my tail number for my aircraft. I say, thank you so much, right this way. Or if you pull up the gate with tarmac access, you'll need that number. I actually like to text that to my tour manager so they just have it right on their phone. It's so much easier than pulling these up. Um, what's nice here is you'll see your airports. Everything's in military time here. Can you guys see my cursor as well? Mm -hmm. or no? Okay, great. Yes. Um, and then flight times. It's uh, crazy enough between a G4SP or a Citation 10, which is a smaller jet, but much quicker, um, or light jets, they all gonna fly and land within 10 to 15 minutes difference uh, between the different speeds of the aircraft. So it's important to see and know when you're gonna land. Um, and we can get into it in a little, little bit, but tracking has gotten so much better than ever before. The technology there is improving every year. There's multiple options to send your driver to send a Bob Dates and say, you know, they're gonna be landing early. There was tailwinds, they're backing them up a little bit. Um, there's also other things like ATC, um, you know, delays as well. So there's things that are out of control, uh, air traffic control delays um, that happen. So, so to let the drivers know to be there, to be ready to have the cars by the plane, all of that's available to you uh, when you're flying in private. Um, but this shows the routing. This was a run we did out to London. And then I kind of hid the names to protect the identities here. So I apologize to strikeouts. But you'll also have your pilot's names, uh, your second and in command uh, your flight attendant um, as well. I, when we can, I always provide uh, cell phone numbers to the pilots. The goal is call me. Um, I want to be able to handle these for you. Um, I kind of want to know. I'm a very much uh, put myself in your shoes person. I kind of feel the, the intensity of getting things in on time uh, with the tour manager. But in an emergency situation or if you're out of the country, I always want a backup of having the contact information for the crew so you can let them know. This is interesting. A lot of people suggest we put lead passenger as the artist. Um, I never do that. Um, lead passenger doesn't mean they're getting special treatment when they're on the plane. It means if there's a problem or they have a question, they're gonna come to you. So I always grab the TM or the PM when they're on the plane to say, hey, go to this person if they need anything. And then finally down here is just what we talked about. So these are the FBOs. So on this trip, we used Atlantic. You'll have their phone number. You'll have their address to tell to your driver or, you know, Uber or whatever. And we went to London here and then came back to Atlantic. So it's pretty simple um, as far as that goes. Um, I think, it, I think it's also um, also worth a mention to just when you're talking about FBOs to know that Signature and Atlantic can be found, they're a brand and they can be found in all your major cities and all your major hubs. And they'll have, they'll likely have locations at the FBOs at international airports, as well as your regional executive airports as, and, uh, as well in smaller places. You know, that's a good point. And that's one thing I didn't bring up earlier when we were talking about the size of aircrafts. You also need to be careful if you're flying into a smaller city, their runway length. So any right. good jet guy will be able to figure that out for you and let you know you can't right. arrive there or you can. There are a lot of hot, you know, there's a lot of hot points. There's runway length. There's the, the, the hour that that particular FBO or city is available for, for landing. Sometimes yeah. you might think you're going into some place and somehow the hours are not going to work. What happens if you're meant to take off no later than 11 o'clock somewhere, but you had a, a, a tech issue at the show and the show ran late and now you can't get that artist to that FBO to get off the ground to get back home. You may have to surface your jet to another FBO in the market. There's a lot of interesting things that can happen with planes. And I wanna also just jump in really quick to, to bring home that point that Ray Amico made in the chat about shopping around for jet quotes because I have had this happen to me on numerous occasions. Jet companies do not necessarily own their fleet. Like Doug said, they're not the bus company. When you call around to different bus companies, you're gonna get a, a quote on those fleets. Those are proprietary vehicles owned by those companies. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten quotes for the same jet if you're shopping around your jet brokers. It's a little bit different, ladies and gentlemen, than shopping around for buses, okay? You, you will find, there's only so many planes, particularly if your client has a specific jet that they want or need, 
There's only so many jets that are going to be possible. You're going to see the same jets from different people. Um, so that's something that, that, that you've, got, you've got to also remember when you're starting to book jets, particularly one officer for a tour. Okay. So back over to Doug to finish up. Hey, Doug. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point. Go ahead, Bob. Um, I, I, because you and I definitely sort of cross collateralize so often, I want to offer the, the uh, attendees some research tools that we all use. Uh, the limousine company, industry, the limousine industry uses it, the air flight and tour managers use it. There, there, there's a, um, a subscribed um, a service called AccuQuick, which you can subscribe to, uh, I think free of charge, um, that is a national US and international guide to airports and charter FBOs which city by city gives you the length of the air of the of the, the runway and the and the hours of operation and the time zone that they're in and then lists the various FBOs that are in each airport that then there's another service called flight aware right which you can track every commercial aircraft in the air through flight aware and you can also track charter aircraft that are not blocked right the, and right. one thing about doug uh, doug's service is that that um certain entertainment entities prefer to be more confidential and more incognito by chartering you have the ability to travel secretly right. i hate to use that word right. but there's a, there's a weird hobby out there that's so interesting to me that people i don't even know what they call it but you have these guys that go to these private fbos and they just take pictures of jets and there's a whole website of people. Oh, I saw this tail number flying here, flying there. Doesn't matter who's on it. Yeah. The privacy it's can like be an issue. Train spotting. Train spotting. There it is. Wow. So uh, you know they're out there, and you know that's why a lot of tail numbers are blocked on those services. Uh, there's another really great one that just came out. I'm trying to look at the app here. It was I definitely use FlightAware, and I'd also mention to anyone who's interested, FlightAware also has a very very interesting weekly email that they send out. Um, with interesting factoids about openings and closings and ups and downs and things. It's just an, another little nerd out for those of us who nerd out about logistics and things. It's another way to nerd out. Get an email. You could nerd out some more like me. Even if you like that one, there's this one, <laughs> there's a new one, an app called Flight Radar 24. And mm. you can literally get an overhead of the airport and just touch little planes and you can find your plane. And that one's by the second. Uh, Flight Aware takes about 10 minutes to let you know they've taken off. Flight radar, it's within 30 seconds. You'll know where they're moving. And it's great to give that information to your drivers as well. Let them know exactly when it's coming in, if there's any delay. Doug, Doug, by the way, um, Doug Wilson, if, if there's, or, or some, or no, maybe Doug Weisner, the, the, the guy or the person who's at the airport photographing tail numbers, if you could possibly get their license plate number, we'd like to have them followed. <laughs> it's a hobby. I've seen it out there. It's kind of a kind of a like some underlying, deeply deep-seated emotional problem. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Go back to model trains, right? It's way safer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tour buses as well. Your your tour buses will get photographed outside your venue and they'll get uploaded onto Facebook. There are groups of people who find that an interesting thing to do. So just be aware that of that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Doug to, Doug to you. No, keep going, keep going. I'm sorry. No, my, please. Mark. I I had a couple a couple uh, more points before we keep the the discussion going on jets. Can you explain explain to us and our students what a mechan me mechanical is and why TMs need to take them into consideration when chartering yeah. jets? Yeah. So it's it's really important to know about mechanicals and just the idea of it. I mean, we're all trying to get people from A to B in a big metal tube in the sky and, and things happen. I don't want people to think that don't know what mechanicals are, that they're devastating. They can be small. Um, it can be a little red light coming on in the dash and the pilot says, give me two hours. We need to get this fixed or a part's coming over. It doesn't have to mean the plane's going to be held up for months um, in recovery or in repair. But that being said, when they do happen and it happens you know, more than you would think it can happen. Um, you can have a flight planned and I get a call three hours before and they say, Doug, uh, the plane can't go at the scheduled departure time. And in the touring world, that's, it can be pretty devastating. It can be missed shows, being late for shows and what have you. 
So, you know, just knowing that that's where having really good relationship with your, with your broker really helps. Again, we have the hybrid thing where we also broker out. And if you're working directly with only an operator, meaning a fleet manager, somebody that just has their own set of planes, if you can't recover that aircraft on your own fleet, a lot of times, and it's, it's frustrating, but you get the good luck, we'll get you on the next one. And it doesn't help you when it's, you know, 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, I had a, a, an instance last year where we had a video game tournament, which are the biggest things on the planet now, 70,000 people coming to a, a venue on the East Coast. And it was, they were playing a show the night before and it was a mechanical and it was a recovery. And that's where you really need somebody to jump in there and see what's available. And by being a broker, you're not just limited to the fleet you booked, but everybody's fleet. So you start looking at what's available, how soon they can get in position. You need to realize that pilots typically have a three hour call out. If they're at home sleeping, they give them three hours to wake up, you know, throw their uniform on, drive to the airport and prep the aircraft. So that's before they even depart if they're in the same city that you need them to be in. So let's say they're an hour away. So you're determining all these factors. Okay, this guy has a three hour call out or maybe you get lucky and you find somebody that just finished a flight and they're already at the airport. Well, that will save us an hour and a half. Well, let's get them in position. So you're moving all these planes around, but you're doing it on such a short uh, time scale that commonly can be more expensive than the plane you booked. And uh, people, it's hard for people to get that, but yeah, I'm sorry, this plane was this price point, Reco the recovery is this price point, it's going to be more, but that's what we have to do to keep moving on and they happen. now. It gets down to the questions you ask when you're booking the plane originally. It's really important to find out how big that fleet is. There are some operators out there, they're not cheap, but they say we guarantee all our planes for mechanicals. So they'll throw a recovery in at no additional charge, but you're paying more for them in the very beginning. So that's why I always recommend when you're looking at your options, you ask really good questions, not only about safety of the aircraft, but are they tour friendly? You know, do they, have they done tours before? What have they worked on? And then also, how big is their fleet? If we do have a mechanical and we need to go, how quickly can they get in there and, re and recover? Does that make sense? Yeah, all really great points. And if any of our students have any questions, by all means, please reach out to us and we can address those as well. Um, circling back, and you had shared a little bit of your, your trip sheet, which was an international, if people didn't catch it, an international trip sheet in Australia. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about uh, international taxes, customs, and prepping in advance for international? Yeah, for sure. So um, international, I think we talked about a little bit earlier. It's always good to, to buffer that time frame out even longer just to make sure you're finding the best options. Um, there's certain quirks, um, especially now. We're in unprecedented times. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard that term a billion times now. But uh, things are changing. I had an, uh, a film where we had to get a lead actor out to Australia recently. And literally we're waiting for the Royal Crown of Australia to decide if they're gonna shut down the production before we can fly him out and his contract started within a few days. So you have more issues as far as getting permits in place, getting visas in place, which we all need before the flight can leave. Um, but there's also other issues. Uh, cabotage is a big word that uh, we use in our industry, a big uh, headache for us, where an aircraft, let's say you're flying into Canada, you can't take a US plane fly to one point in Canada, and then fly to another point in Canada, it has to be a Canadian operator. And it happens all over the world. So if you're dealing with Mexico, if you're dealing with Canada, you have to make sure you're using a Canadian operator for those inter-Canadian flights or inner uh, flights through Mexico. Um, so those can be difficult um, as far as how to get around. Um, and then there's other issues too with uh, international taxes. Uh, France has incredibly high international per passenger taxes when you're flying through France. Uh, Australia has an issue where you can avoid the taxes if you pay from a U.S. bank and you don't change your uh, passenger manifest in Australia, meaning you keep the same passengers on and don't switch them out through different legs of the flight. You can avoid paying these taxes. And these taxes can be 10% of your entire bill. So it can get really, really expensive um, if you don't know what you're doing. So just looking at the lay of the land and really kind of planning it out the best you can with as much time in front. And then looking for those little quirks to make sure you're not paying any additional fees is, is best. I did want to touch on really quick um, what Adrian was saying with crew duty. It's a little bit of a, a, a quagmire, but uh, I'll go through it as, as quickly as possible. So crew duty on a plane is just like a uh, tour bus driver. They have 14 hours they got to play with. 
the formula is there. I can explain the formula to you, but it's even better just to talk to your jet guy to get the answer to that because you have them prepping the plane, putting the plane back. Is the plane flying out of the city you're departing from? Is it returning back to a home base away from where you're departing from? All of that eats down into your hours. So when you're looking at that 14 hours, you can't just say, hey, I have 14 hours to do this. Also, if you have consecutive days, it's only a 10 hour, 10 hour, 10 hour a day on a two person flight crew, uh, more if you have a three person flight crew. Um, so you have to really manage that out. And that's where a good relationship with somebody that understands Turing that says, hey, this artist gets off stage at, at nine, but frequently he won't be back from the club until two. So you really need to manage that. Do we have time? Are the pilots gonna be tapping their toe at the airport saying we gotta go? And unfortunately it's, it's a legal issue. So you either have a situation where the pilots will go get hotels and stay the night and charge you the daily minimums of the plane for one more day, or they fly off. Now, now knock on wood, I've never had a fly off before. It's never happened to me in my career, but they have the right to saying they have a flight the next day, they're gonna get back to it and they're gonna go. And there's no refund. You know what I mean? If they're there ready for you and you don't show up, they got to go. So there's this kind of misnomer that because it's a private jet, it's always waiting for you. Um, and with good planning, we can make it feel that way. And we can make the tour manager look like a rock star. But, um, you know, it, it does happen when you really stretch those duty days that you can have some issues. So I recommend always talking to your jet broker and just kind of getting the best advice possible. There's another caveat on there where you can actually do crew rest and the opposite problem happens, meaning you fly into a city knowing you're going to be there a really long time past the 14 hours, and then you put the crew down for 10 hours rest. So the problem there can be if your artist wants to leave early and your crew is still legally required to stay and rest for three more hours, then they can't leave. And that's just as frustrating to a lot of people. So and then, um, and then just to interject, sometimes you're going to have weather that rolls in and whether or not these jets can take off from these airports. So mm -hmm. it's really, really important to understand and communicate with your jet person, your jet guy, your jet broker about what you are doing, particularly if you're hubbing and it's it's a get back home or a get back to the, the, the city that you're hubbing in and not just a move forward. This whole go down for rest, get there. How long are you in the city? Did the artist leave the hotel to get to the jet in the first place on time? Have they now eaten into that rest time? How do you fix that? That stuff is what really makes jet charter complicated. It's not just sitting there 24 seven waiting to leave. There are a lot of regulations. Yeah, for sure. Um, and if, you know, there's a lot of information there and I think it can be a little bit overwhelming, but if you try to think of it in terms of, of there are many similarities to how you manage and approach buses just the stakes are higher with, with jets, you know, so you have driver hours, you have pilot hours that, you know, with the exception of the, the safety ratings that Doug discussed, you know, there are many, many similarities and the same thing is true. I didn't know about the inter-Canadian flights with a non-Canadian jet, but it, the same applies to Canadian bus operators going into the US and picking up, you know, let's say a UK artist flies into the US, that Canadian uh, provider We'll have to have them flying to Canada, I believe, or that was certainly the case at one point. Um, I know we're running tight on time, but I re really wanted to finish up by talking relationships and bring Zan back into the conversation here. Um, I've worked with Rocket a bunch of times, uh, always had an amazing experience. And, and, and it's true that all of us who work in the industry, for the most part, we, we have long-standing relationships with people like yourselves like 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 Doug and Bob here who we know we can trust and you know like I said way earlier in the episode we can shoot off a couple of emails and know that it's done and dealt with because we have that long-standing trust and relationship there I'm, I'm curious to know from from your side how you cultivate those those relationships how you establish them in the first place and I have a story uh with my logistics partner for that, but I'd love to hear your input on it, uh, first of all. I, it's just building trust and it's, it's going through the thick and thin with, with 
your production managers and and um just proving yourself over and over. We love what we do. You know, we love figuring out the the hard and complicated and the impossible things. And when we're able to come up with a solution, you know, you start to build that trust, you start to build that relationship, you know, and you see these production managers, tour managers, they move from tour to tour and, you know, you get to come along for the ride, you know, throughout the years. I mean, I've known David weird. I mean, I started with rocket in 2000. Wow. What year were you with green day? Dave. Five one. I'm trying to think because it was so long ago. <laughs> yeah. But I think 2002, three, I think. Maybe? I was thinking 2004, but wow. you know, it's like you just build relationships that yeah. some, some production managers are some of my greatest friends, you know, right. um, you know, because you start to care about one another and, um, and just, I think it's just proving yourself, proving you that you're capable and that, you know, you love what you do and you want to make it work for them and you want to make it easy for them. Like, I mean, when I think about all the, the weight on your shoulders, if I can just take something off of you, Hey, I'm, I'm good at what I do and let me handle that for you. So. Right. So. Well, and, and would you say that most of your, your business comes from uh, recommendation or are, are you active in going to let's say industry showcases when those were a thing and, and things like that yeah <laughs> um, we're definitely out there at trade shows and and conferences and stuff like that promoting but I mean I think it just goes back to building the relationship you relationships, know you get relationships, relationships, relationships. that say oh you know oh I used rocket for this or I used whoever might it might be you know, give them a call. You know, I had, um, you, it's like you just get passed along for, for word of mouth. I mean, I get multiple emails like, hey, I worked with so-and-so on this tour and said you could do the impossible. So can you help me? And that's how we get around. So. Right. Um, and I just wanted to quickly share the story with you is, you know, I, I used to be based in the UK and I worked with your, your colleague and still work with your colleague, Chris Palmer. Um, who we had on on a previous episode and um, when I moved to Canada here um, I had a, a gentleman from from another company Global Motion who I'd, I wasn't aware of hadn't hadn't worked with prior to that and he came out to a show and um, he made such a personal impression on me coming to a small club show for a band that was still blowing up as as we mentioned earlier and have now blown up um, you know there was a there was a connection there and and i just i, I gained you know i i was like this this guy's come made the effort to come down to our show introduced himself and you know he was like he said to me my phone is always on 24 7 and i know that is is consistent across the industry but i started working with him then and i have tested that claim on on more occasions than i would have liked to um, you know, being at the border between Norway and, and, and Denmark at three in the morning Canadian time on a Sunday, and he is true to his word. So for me, that's a relationship where I'm here that, that is, has been for, for the last five years and, and I've relied on so heavily. So I think it's in, in that sense, it's really, I go to him knowing that he can do the job for me here and he always comes through for me. So, and, and I hope that he also knows that I'm not going to bring him, I'm going to try my best to not bring him any bullshit. <laughs> and I'm really not going to try and drop any really horrible situations on his lap unless I can really avoid it. So, um, uh, Doug and Bob, I, Doug, first of all, I noticed, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't, with the, with the, size of artists and the profile of artists I work with, I don't use jets a lot, if at all. But I do notice there are a lot of jet guys on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> is that an active practice to, to seek out new business or, you know? Yeah. You know, there's, uh, there's other companies that they are out there that, um, you know, one, one larger one that they kind of, uh, they don't have any limits as far as who they reach out to. But remember too, it's, it's not just the, 
entertainment industry, right? These guys can be going after lawyers and they can go after CEOs and, and whomever else. So they're out there. Um, but again, it's, it's really, like I said before, really important to find people that have kind of been in it and have a couple of battle scars. Um, and that's yeah. uh, what really helps kind of cement some of the relationships. But yeah, there's so many. And here's the, the key too, is we're not licensed. So I wish we were. I wish we were because you have to get a license with 1500 hours to cut hair, but not to put somebody on a plane. So you get a lot of these basement brokers out there as well that do it on the spare time, you know, knew a friend or, uh, you know, met somebody in a club and says they're now, now, now brokering jets. So yeah. hopefully that changes in the future. Um, but uh, there's a lot out there. And I, I don't know any of my tour manager clients that said um, that they haven't got a weekly call from somebody looking for business. Sure. It's just going to happen. And, and for, for, from my side, you know, as and when I do have need for jet, my first, but you know, it doesn't bother me at all that they're on LinkedIn. It gives, you know, it makes me aware of their existence, but I would call one of my esteemed, my first port of call would be to call one of my esteemed colleagues on this panel and ask for recommendations and they would yeah. refer me to you. And then we would have a wonderful working relationship <laughs> from there. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, how about you? Let's let's hear how you you keep your relationships strong. Extortion and blackmail. <laughs> and cannolis, cannolis, cannolis. Bob, Bob keeps his relationships strong with cannolis, Doug. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's cannolis. Used to be a fair trade item. This is true. No, I listen. I toured. I I didn't tour. I've been employed and unemployed like everyone else. And I think that uh, I'll give you a quick story. Does it, I think people know who Stuart Ross is. He's been here with us previously. He's previous been on with us, it. yeah. So I walk into the Beacon Theater in the 90s. That's in the previous century. And uh, <laughs> one of my hobbies is listening to people's accents. So I, can, I would ask Doug if he was a Glaswegian or if he was from Edinburgh or somebody was from Boston or somebody. Oh my God, you said it right. Glaswegian? No, you said Edinburgh, right? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, just had to say it. <laughs> it also confirms my age. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I walk into the Beacon Theater and uh, Stuart Ross, I was, I was working for a limo company who had two op, uh, who had co bi-coastal offices. And my California colleague said, go visit Stuart Ross. He's at the Beacon Theater with the Spinal Tap Tour. Go say hello, hold his hand and say hello. So I called him and I, I called him before I went and I said, can I come visit you? My, my colleague, Heather, in, in, on the West Coast, who has since married Bernie Taupin, that's another little side story, um, said I should come say hello. And he goes, yeah, sure, come down, come, come down, say hello. And I said, you sound like a Cleveland Jew to me, which was, may seem a little racist, but that's what they sound like. So he goes, oh, well, come on down, we'll talk about it. So I show up at the Beacon Theater production office on the second floor backstage at the Beacon Theater. And the first question he asked me was, how did you get up on the second floor backstage at the Beacon Theater without anyone telling me? And I said, this is what I do, which is again, experience. And he goes, why did you ask me if I was a Cleveland Jew? I said, because that's my hobby. I used to live in Cleveland and I can recognize him. It turns out Stuart Ross and I grew up on the same street in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> We have since become fast friends and very loyal client vendor. So Doug, relationships, as I think everyone here and everyone who's attending this will, will, will attest that this is a relationship, a relational industry, which is based on competence, availability, accessibility, and a certain, maybe a, just a certain, zest for life that we all must share. I mean, I'm not a big social media presence person, so you can't look me up on LinkedIn um, unless it's an old guy with a mustache and, and thinning <laughs> hair. I don't, I don't think I there's no category for that. But I mean, I really think that day in, day out, we build our relationships based on our consistency, our presence, our continued presence, our dedication, and, and really, I think we all have to share a love for what we do. And the mere fact that we're all still here and, and plan to be here when we come out the other side of whatever else is going on. Um, it's really about relationships. It's really about your dedication, honesty, 
every admirable trait someone should have, we should all exercise at one time or another. Sweet, Bob. Uh, well, said. Yeah. well said, Bob. If, I if we can... Like, oh, go ahead, Zan. No, keep going, Zan. No, um, just to touch upon what Bob just shared, I had a client and we... I, it's happened twice in my 20 years at Rocket where we missed a show. And uh, thankfully, rental gear was available. So the show did go on, but they didn't have their stuff. But um, when we knew, or in the morning when we just kept missing flight after flight, the freight kept getting bumped and bumped. You know, I'm calling the production manager going, it got bumped again. It got bumped again. And I'll be honest, they were the worst phone calls I've ever had to make, you know, um, when you know that you're not going to come through for somebody and on the last call of the night. And I mean, in the meantime, over the course of the day, we're trying everything that we can to make this happen. We thought the, the freight was on board the last plane. We had arranged a police escort from the airport to the venue so the gear could get there in time for doors. And, you know, I made the last call and I said, it's not on the plane. And, you know, F-bombs, you know, everything got, you know, said on the phone to me and I hung up and, you know, it was just like, I did what I could and it was horrible. But within three hours, that production manager called me back and he said, Zan, you worked your ass off today and you were honest with me the whole entire time, you know, and I think like when you said honesty, Bob, that's where it was like, when you're honest with your clients, you know, there's, you can't go wrong, you know, and it was amazing. And he trusted me. And still to this day, he's one of, you know, one of my guys. And we laugh about it now. Do you, do you remember when you missed that show? And it's like, oh yeah, I remember that. But it was bottom line is honesty. And when you're dedicated to what you do, you know, you, you, I'm at the mercy most of times using commercial airlines, truckers, you know, I don't have my own planes. I don't have my own trucks. I don't have my own ocean vessels, but just staying informed, keeping who needs to be informed, informed. And absolutely. So can I, can I, can I uh, recognize someone who just, uh, just typed something in on the chat? Am I allowed to do that? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I want to shout out to Peggy. Uh, in Denver, who just told me that she met me 30 years ago when I was road managing Van Halen, and I had a glint in my eye. I, Phoebe, I was really- Still does, drunk. still does. It wasn't a glint, it was, a, I was drunk. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a glint in my eye. And as, and as Phoebe may remember, 30 years ago, at Soundcheck, it started to snow. I was a production runner on that show. Oh yeah. my God. Wow. <laughs> it started to snow at Soundcheck and by the time the doors opened, there were six inches of snow and it was, in the, it was at the end of summer and it was unseasonably cold. And so the glint, just to qualify, the glint in my eye was complete annihilation, Phoebe. I, I was, Bob, we were looking I... around for, for <laughs> gloves and God rest his soul. I would have worked for with, you that and, day. Uh, and if you, here you go. <laughs> oh my God, I that, can't believe it. Mary Jo, if you remember at the end of the night, when the band came off stage, we all looked at Edward Van Halen. And I will tell you, I, if I can get through this without crying, um, Ed had a wonderful glint in his eye. There was mischief in his life, as was his brother, Alex, who's the older, older of the two brothers. And Ed came off stage and looked at his amp, walked over to his amp and made a snowball. And he had already called the audience of 22,000 people Q-tips because they all had 10 inches of snow on the top of their heads. And everybody yelled at Ed, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And Ed had that glint in his eye. He turned around and threw one snowball at the audience at Fiddler's Green and 22,000 snowballs hit the stage. So it was insane. Fast, fast forward is only one light bulb was broken on the on on the video wall. There, there was no other damage or personal injury, but twenty two thousand. The sight of seeing twenty two thousand snowballs flying through the air. It was. I, I don't. I don't know who who could have related. It was I insane. enjoy you, Bob. I enjoy you. <laughs> Sorry. One of my nope. favorites. 
secrets. <laughs> no. And now no my mind is blown. No <laughs> shortage of surprises in 2.0 here on TM 101. I want to thank our guest um, for joining us today. This was an incredible conversation on logistics. And we couldn't have asked for to have better special guests with us today to get us through this for everyone who may miss this episode today. It's going to be on our YouTube uh, once we wrap up for anyone to catch up on uh, next week, next Monday, we'll be diving into travel on November 16th. And like always, we will give you all the information this week. As we get closer, there'll be new guest, new topic, and we'll be continuing the conversation. On 2.0 is 101. clearly the nerd sessions. So. <laughs> um, and like always, y'all can always reach out to us if you'd like to be put in touch with any of our special guests or have any logistic questions, please reach out to us and we'll uh, connect you up the chains to all the right people. Thanks everybody. Yes, have a fantastic and safe week. Everyone Appreciate have a great it. weekend. <laughs> great week. Everyone have a great, great week. week. <laughs> We're on Mondays now. We're on Mondays weekend. now. <laughs>